no matter what country started a nuclear war, our whole world could go out like a light bulb and there would be no one to turn it on. We are all children who fear for the future of our world. The United States and Soviet Union are building more and more human killing weapons. And every day the threat of nuclear war becomes greater. Dear Mr. President, we want peace, not war. Stop making bombs. Dear President Reagan, I would like you to take apart all the weapons so no one can get hurt. Please don't make any more and make the world safe for the animals too. Respect everything in this world. Stephen Douglas Powell. Dear Mr. President, we want peace, not war. We started reading this morning at 8 o'clock. Um, and we're, we're continuing until the letters are all read. We may be down at 10 o'clock tonight, we don't know. Um, we've, we had asked President Reagan to meet with us so that we could present the letters to him, but um, early this summer he said that he was too busy to meet with children. I teach at a school in Oxford, Michigan, and there are 10 kids that we drove uh, 500 and some miles to come here to Washington, D.C. to participate in the campaign, uh, the children's campaign for nuclear disarmament. I think that the kids feel this deep concern about all living things on this planet and see nuclear arms and the nuclear arms race is just not making any sense. It is estimated that one nuclear submarine possesses warheads with more explosive power than that of all the munitions used in the Second World War. 2% of the world's nuclear arsenal could kill every man, woman, and child on our planet. The possibility of such a nuclear annihilation represents the greatest challenge to the continuance of life on Earth. On August 6, 1981, 36 years to the day from the bombing of Hiroshima, a group of concerned Americans joined in a 35-mile, three-day walk from the town of Washington, Vermont, to the town of Moscow, Vermont. This was one of the first demonstrations to call on the United States and the Soviet Union to initiate a mutual nuclear weapons freeze. This symbolic march was organized at a grassroots level by the American Friends Service Committee, the Vermont Ecumenical Council, and other community groups. Something that was brought up there, and I thought about it, and I wanted to get here. And then finding out two days ago that I'm pregnant, that I've got extra life with me. I'm, I'm like super concerned about what's going to happen. August 6, 1945 the day that forever changed the course of history. The Hiroshima bomb killed over 100,000 people. Today, the world possesses nuclear warheads equivalent in strength to well over one million Hiroshima-type bombs. By the second day of the march, the call for a nuclear weapons freeze had begun to attract national attention, and as the marchers approached the State House in Montpelier, the size of the Vermont Peace Walk had grown to include hundreds of all ages. One of the highlights of the day was the collecting of letters addressed to the White House, written by children who opposed the arms race. The children who gathered these letters from around the nation form a group called the Children's Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Susan Rabin is the principal spokesperson for the group. My eighth grade American history textbook mentioned the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in perhaps one paragraph. That was all that was said in that class about the beginning of the end of the world. Even though there is little discussion in schools about the nuclear threat, kids are very aware of it and fighting for their lives. Do not, for God's sake, imagine that you've accomplished anything just by coming here today or even by participating in the walk. Economist John Kenneth Galbraith. I ask that all of you see a personal responsibility for furthering the politics of arms control. We happen in this state to have representatives that are committed and fully committed to this goal. I would like to urge upon everyone here and everyone within the sound of my voice that we are not in this race protecting our way of life. We are indeed endangering our way of life and if there is a culminating exchange of nuclear destruction, 
the way of life will be ended forever on both sides. Other speakers included author Grace Paley, Dr. Martin Schatz of the Physicians for Social Responsibility, Congressman James Jeffords, and many more. I don't approve of unilateral disarmament because if it's meant to teach the Soviet Union by exhortation and example, obviously it's not going to work. The crowd also heard from Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont. The Soviet Union shares our fear of a nuclear holocaust. And I am convinced that our planners on both sides understand that there can be no winners in a nuclear war. We now face not only the very real possibility but I feel that we face the probability of a global nuclear war started by accident in this century unless we change and change very, very soon. After a long day of speeches, the marchers watched a performance called Who's Got the Button, which made a mockery of the insanities of war. These marchers were part of a steadily growing movement, which in the past year alone has seen 100,000 march in Rome, 150,000 in London, 350,000 in West Germany, and 700,000 in New York, all for the cause of peace. There was time, too, to feel a heightened sense of the value of every individual life, to celebrate the spirit of brotherhood that had brought them to the march in the first place. there for one common purpose, to create an atmosphere in which war is no longer inevitable. Last night I had the strangest dream I'd ever dreamed before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I saw a mighty room, and the room was filled with men. And a paper they were signing said they'd never play it again. We have nine miles to go. I'll be very brief. Mr. Kapralov is a counselor at the Soviet Embassy. He has been involved in the support work for the SAL II negotiations, that is, each time... A On the last day of the march, Dave McCauley of the American Friends Service Committee introduced Yuri Kapralov at a church in Waterbury, Vermont. He's been in our country for three years, uh, attached to the uh, Soviet Embassy in Washington, D.C., and his message today, his comments today are on Soviet views, on nuclear weapons control and the nuclear weapons freeze. Please join me in welcoming Yuri Kapalov. My colleagues and I really appreciate this occasion to come here to Waterbury to be with you today. In fact, we are honored by the invitation of the American Friends Service Committee to come here to communicate with you. I should state from the very outset that we take a very favorable view of this idea of nuclear freeze. During the Second World War, my nation lost 25 million people. Half of those 25 million were frontline soldiers. Half of those 25 million people were civilians. Children, women among them. We are not defying the United States. We want to live with you in peace, on good terms, we are not going to achieve nuclear superiority over you, but at the same time we are not going to let you achieve nuclear superiority over us. But I believe this is a fair, fair uh, position.
One of the reasons that we distrust governments, whether they are social... Mr. Kapralov was put to the test in a difficult question-and-answer session in which the marchers placed their primary goal of a nuclear weapons freeze ahead of the individual goals of the United States and the Soviet Union. By the time the marchers reached Moscow, Vermont, they had not only ended a long trek through the countryside, they had revived their enthusiasm for the new peace movement. They were diplomats for peace on the road to global sanity. There was much to be proud of, but there was much work ahead. John Case, a Vermont labor leader, spoke to those who had completed the walk. The question is, how do we get from here today to the day where the policy of the United States government is for disarmament. Several weeks later, on Solidarity Day, demonstrators at this union-sponsored event pressed the government to spend more money on social programs by redirecting some of the funds that are being spent on armaments and on the military. Alongside economic questions, the awakening disarmament movement had been brought home to the nation's capital. Well, I believe in working for peace, and I feel that that's a major issue here, and that we're expanding our defense budget immensely, for mainly for nuclear weapons, at the same time that we're cutting off the programs that these people are protesting for, the Social Security and retirement, and it's just very interrelated. Through Solidarity Day, through the Vermont Walk, through marches in the United States and throughout the world, and through groups like the Children's Campaign, the world has made an overture towards peace. The Vermont Peace Walk was a beginning on the long road towards disarmament. In a small New England state, a group of dedicated and brave citizens were taking a simple and dramatic public step on the major public issue of our time. These pioneers of the new disarmament movement helped to build a growing awareness of the nuclear threat. For the first time in many years, our fears are balanced with new hope for our future and the future of our children. Dear Mr. President, why after building bombs for so many years do we still need to build more? Please get together right now with the Soviet Union to stop the nuclear arms race. I have nightmares, and I am afraid we will all be killed, and then it will be too late. Caroline Hissom, age 11. Last night I had the strangest dream I'd ever dreamed before. I dreamed. Put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty moon, and the room was filled with men. And a paper they were signing said they'd never play it again. Last night I had the strangest dream. I'd ever dreamed for 